At the Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland today, the Army rolled out its new XM-1 tank, a turbine-powered 59-ton speedster that at 45 miles an hour has twice the speed and mobility of current models. It's the first completely new tank to roll off the assembly line in America in 20 years. It cost over a billion dollars to develop. Its past and perhaps its future are clouded in controversy. Truer words have never been spoken. The M1 Abrams is simultaneously one of the most ubiquitous and controversial tanks ever made. Despite its highly successful service history, it has had many negative claims leveled against it, mostly centering around its development. The M1 we know today had two rivals on its road to procurement, the General Motors XM1 and the German Leopard 2AV. Many people believe that due to government conspiracies, the wrong tank was chosen both times. Actually, using the past tense wouldn't be correct, because people still repeat these theories today. And when you ask them, well, how were the rival tanks better? The answer usually comes down to they use diesel engines. You probably guessed that the actual situation is a bit more complex than that, and you'd be right. So we're going to take a trip back in time to figure out if the army actually made the right choice, or if the M1 is a product of government corruption. Well, I feel like there's a bit of corruption in there either way, but you know what I mean. It all starts in the early 60s with something called the MBT-70 program. The then Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, yes, that one, wanted a common main battle tank for NATO. You see, at that time, about 5% of NATO weaponry was jointly produced. If the Soviet Union got spicy and the Cold War did go hot, logistics would be very complicated. It'd be led by the US Army and German Bundeswehr, with other nations hopefully joining in later. The Army didn't want a joint project, though. They just wanted a new tank that worked, and as soon as possible. McNamara made them go along with it. He was hoping for a technological exchange, but the army found that Germany didn't have much to offer. Eventually, issues arose, mainly due to the joint nature of the program. There were issues with communication, negotiation, logistics, standardization, and even philosophy. Development was so disjointed that the MBT ended up using both Imperial and Metric, with Metric being the overriding system in areas where work overlapped. It certainly didn't help that the tank was very complicated. It was designed to house all of the crew in the turret, for the sake of simplifying NBC protection. The driver had a counter-rotating capsule that would keep him facing forward. The main gun was a massive gun launcher that could fire both kinetic rounds and missiles. Each side tried to bring their own parts to the table. The American autoloader worked, but the German one was very unreliable. It was the opposite case with the engine, where the American AVCR-1100 was very troublesome. Don't worry, we'll be talking about it a lot later. The Shillelagh missile was largely a failure, and that's putting it pretty mildly. Eventually, the program was cancelled, especially when Congress found out that each tank would cost around $1 million per tank. That probably doesn't sound like a lot now, but trust me, 1970s dollars? Yeah, that's a lot. Also, cooperation with Germany was making things more difficult, not easier. The Army and Congress then outlined a tank program that would focus on delivering a capable, relatively cheap, and survivable tank in a short time frame. So, pretty much the opposite of what the MBT-70 turned out to be. This program would eventually lead to the M1. Two car companies would end up competing, General Motors and Chrysler. One of these companies was doing great financially, the other was not. Given that only one of them is still around, I'll let you guess which company wasn't doing so hot. If you guess Chrysler, you get one of those cool scratch and sniff stickers. Probably diesel scented? That fits with the theme, right? Anyway, for Chrysler, this contract was pretty much do or die. So when they designed their prototype, they went all out. The heart of which was the unproven AGT-1500 gas turbine engine. Gas turbines offer some very enticing benefits, such as low smoke and noise signatures, better performance at the sprocket, and better reliability. Of course, there were some well-founded concerns about the overall cost and fuel consumption, but Chrysler was willing to take the gamble on a relatively new piece of technology, hoping it would give them a critical edge. General Motors went with a slightly more traditional approach, and I would like to stress slightly, using a variable compression diesel engine. Both tanks were, overall, pretty similar, aside from using different engines, suspension types, and ammo storage solutions. So the popular story goes like this. After thorough testing, the Army decided they liked the GM prototype more. But just as they're about to award the contract at GM, the XM1 project manager, Robert Baer, along with Deputy Secretary Clements, stepped in and gave the contract to Chrysler, because Chrysler was failing and needed the contract more. The Army protested, but their complaints were brushed aside. This is a somewhat accurate account as a basic timeline of events, but otherwise, it is complete nonsense. After the first round of development and operational testing, or DTOT, it was indeed determined that the GM X1 was superior to the Chrysler prototype. However, in the second round of testing, the Chrysler X1 was deemed a better option. So, what happened? 
After the first round of testing, Baird declared that both tanks should be redesigned, so that they could mount either the diesel or the turbine. This decision happened just as GM was about to be awarded the contract, so surely this was just a way to buy Chrysler more time, right? Not exactly. While some detractors act like the diesel and turbine were favored equally, or that the diesel was favored because duh it's a diesel, obviously it would be better, that's just not true. The army did have a clear bias towards the turbine, not only because it was new and innovative, and had those potential performance benefits mentioned earlier, but also because Germany had expressed interest in using it for Leopard 2, again because of the potential benefits. And this wasn't something that was decided at the last second. The two countries had seemingly been floating this idea since 1974, when the MOU was first created. It would later be made official with an addendum to the MOU, which was ratified the same month that the XM1 program altered course. In fact, in a memo Bear wrote just after the announcement that the source selection phase would be extended, he explicitly stated that standardization was the reason that both tanks should be able to accommodate the turbine. That doesn't explain why the turbine-powered Chrysler Prototype 1. The answer to that question can be found in the DTOT testing. The Chrysler tank had a significant edge in mobility, a slight edge in firepower, and the GM had slight edges in vulnerability and fightability. Cost isn't listed here, but the GM was the cheaper of the two. So, you remember how I said the main goals of the program were low cost, survivability, and quick delivery? Well, it should be no surprise that GM won the first round of testing then. Following the testing extension, Chrysler poured a lot of work into improving their design. It was reworked from the ground up, with the armor profile improved and unnecessary bits stripped off to reduce cost. The most important changes to the gun mantlet, which was now much smaller and incorporated composite armor. Originally, it used the cast mantlet, which was not great, and was the army's primary complaint when it came to the armor, so fixing that issue bumped the Chrysler standing up considerably. But what did GM do with the extra time? Essentially nothing. Their design saw very few changes in the interim months. So the second round of DTOT rolls around, and what are the results? Chrysler beats GM. Handily. Chrysler retained their advantages in mobility and firepower, while bringing vulnerability and fightability up to par with GM. Most importantly, however, they managed to bring down costs enough that they could underbid GM, despite the greater cost of the turbine. Chrysler won because they ended up building the better tank. It's really as simple as that. Also, it's generally a myth that the army at large was not on board with the decision. From correspondence between Major General Otis and Lieutenant General Starry, the battlefield is now being tidied up after the tough XM1 source selection exercise. I know that Bob Sudnell contacted you, and feel certain that Bob Bear dropped the line. So, this letter is merely to confirm some items, and to let you know that the armor community has a real winner for the future. As a result of the resolicitation and new bids by the contractors, it was obvious that Chrysler used the five months from May to October to good advantage. First, they took off some of the extra bells and whistles to reduce cost. Second, they fixed some armor weak spots in both hull and turret. Third, they changed their corporate attitude towards contract escape clauses. And finally, they offered a product at a cost that stood up to even the closest scrutiny. So, even though there are many of us that could have been comfortable with a diesel engine, not a single person could find a valid reason for rejecting the turbine. Therefore, they superior offer technically, and the cost that was less than the competitor, Chrysler was an obvious choice. Even so, the Secretary of the Army spent four days of detailed questioning of all of us before making a decision, and the Vice Chief of Staff participated in and agreed with the decision. I've probably revealed more than I should in the above sentences, but you, above any other, have the right and need to know that the selection process was given a full and open hearing, and that the decision was made reasonable and supportable. As for the angle that this whole mess was a way to bail out Chrysler, it just doesn't make much sense. The Army's primary concern was getting a new tank to troops as quickly and as cheaply as possible. The only piece of evidence I can find for this claim comes from a 1987 article published in the Washington Monthly. It alleges that Chrysler's chairman, John J. Ricardo, paid a visit to President Ford's financial advisor and basically begged for help. The financial advisor then spoke to the Army. We went and talked to the people in the Pentagon, Seedman recalls. We wanted to find out whether Chrysler was going to win that contract. We let them know that there was a problem at Chrysler, and that Chrysler was in for help. Seedman insists that we didn't order anything, we just made sure that they were aware of the problem. This meeting is said to have taken place on June 17, 1976. That's about a month before the announcement to extend the program. But, as you might remember, the turbine had already been favored by both the US and Germany for quite a while, possibly two years prior. It also tries to paint the situation in a very specific way, trying to make it seem like GM had little to no time to develop their turbine proposal, which is just not true. To me at least, it's not a very compelling article, especially since it makes some very reformer-esque claims, like that troops couldn't walk behind the M1 without being burned to death, or that the 120 cannon was more dangerous to use because it had combustible cartridge casings like the Sheridan. 
It is true that the Sheridan had an unfortunate habit of blowing itself up sometimes, and the army was cognizant of that, but combustible cartridge casings had come a long way since the 60s. Anyway, I feel like if the army just wanted to bail out Chrysler, they could have awarded them the contract right away. If extending the program was the way to buy Chrysler time so they could improve their tank, what would the army have done if GM kept pace? What if the GM tank was still better? Not to mention that, as then Secretary of the Army Martin Hoffman points out, the financial condition of Chrysler consistently cut against them in the competition. If you can hire one of two contractors, are you going to hire the one that can go bankrupt at any second, or are you going to hire the one that is very successful? If Chrysler went defunct in the midst of fulfilling the contract, it would create turmoil for production. And that's exactly what happened. Now some of you guys watching this might look back with hindsight and say, well the turbine turned out to be a lot of trouble, we should have used the Chrysler design just with the diesel engine. And this is the point where things get really fun, because it turns out the diesel engine was just absolutely terrible. Yes, possibly even more troublesome than the turbine. You remember that really unreliable diesel engine from the MBT-70 program? The AVCR-1100? It came back for the XM1 as the AVCR-1360. It wouldn't be fair to call them the same engine. The 1360 was a derivative of the 1100. But yeah, despite what a lot of tank nerds think, the AVCR-1360 was not based on proven technology. AVCR stood for Army Variable Compression Ratio. Variable compression ratio engines promised to bring the high performance and fuel economy of diesel engines, but at a much lower overall weight and size. It is very important to point out though, that VCR engines were not much more mature than gas turbine engines for ground platforms. The AVCR did have a bit of maturity behind it, since it was already tried on the MBT, but the engine's designers, Teledyne Continental Motors, really struggled to fix its quirks. I did find a report from TCM that talks about the 1360, but if you've watched my channel for a while you know I'm not very smart, and I am certainly not an engineer. But I do have a friend that's an engineer, so I sent it to him. He didn't want to make any definitive statements about what could have been the issue, understandably, but he suspects that, and I quote, the materials used in their thickness provided insufficient margins of safety under load surges. So there you go. While the turbine started out about as unreliable as the AVCR, it improved pretty drastically as the program dragged on. If you want to know how the army felt about the AVCR, just listen to this message from General Starry to Major General Lynch. As I looked through the October 1979 issue of the AZA Army Green Book magazine, I came upon a TCM advertisement expounding on their much vaunted AVCR 1360 engine. The commercial infers that the engine has proven itself as a result of its use on the HIMAG. The facts belie the claim. Our experience during government chassis tests of the HIMAC indicates the engine is not yet reliable or dependable. The HIMAC engine had several significant malfunctions during chassis testing. Two of these failures also occurred during XM1 DT1, failure of the fuel injector pump, and the engine throwing oil out of the crankcase breather tube during tight turns. Additionally, during subsequent contractor testing of the HIMAC at Yuma, the engine failed when parts of the turbocharger were ingested into the engine. Although developmental improvements may have been made in the intervening 15 months since the HIMAG chassis test, the effectiveness of any such improvements remains to be proven in an operational environment. All so-called testing has been in the white suit sterile mode. Based on the facts, any attempt at this time to think that the engine has reached a level of maturity is presumptuous. I don't know about you guys, but I don't think functioning engines eat themselves alive like some kind of dumb Ouroboros. That letter was written in December of 1979, over three years after the turbine was selected and the AVCR still wasn't considered mature by the army. Well, at least the AVCR was more fuel efficient, right? That was the main complaint with the turbine after all. Well, I was amazed when I found this out, but the AVCR was about as fuel efficient as the turbine was. Somehow, depending on the conditions, the AVCR was either slightly more fuel efficient than the turbine, or slightly less. When comparing tanks of the same weight, the AVCR could range from 6.2% more fuel efficient to 4.3 less. That's not even mentioning that because the AVCR still weighed more, a 59-ton tank using it would have less armor. Raw specifications aside, the AVCR's general performance wasn't very flattering either. During force-on-force -force exercises, the M1's adversaries gave it the nickname Whispering Death, thanks to the turbine's low noise signature. During testing, the GM prototype's adversaries gave it the nickname Old Smokey. You probably don't need me to tell you why. While GM accepted the loss, TCM threw a bit of a fit. They undertook a massive lobbying campaign, one that eventually won over some representatives in Congress. Not long after, Congress floated the idea of appropriating funds for a backup diesel engine for the M1. The army very quickly noticed that there was some shady stuff going on, such as the offer practically being designed by TCM, and the amount being so low, no other company could afford to place a bid. 
only TCM could. The turbine wasn't perfect by any means, but it was much farther along, and mostly just had quality control issues by this point. Anyway, I hope that puts the Chrysler bailout myth to bed. Now let's move on to the Leopard 2. I'll try to keep it brief, which probably won't work. As part of the MOU, the US agreed to test an austere version of the Leopard 2, the Leopard 2 AV. If it turned out that the 2 AV was better than the XM1, the army agreed to adopt it. Germany did not make a similar promise for the inverse case, where the XM1 proved to be superior. In late 1976, a 2AV as well as a ballistic hull and turret arrived in the US for testing. The German delegation clarified that their tank actually weighed 59.6 tons, one ton over the 58.6 weight limit. The US said no problem, issued them a waiver, and the tests were conducted in short order. Since US tankers aren't currently driving around on Leopard 2s, you can probably guess that the XM1 won. Germany was less than happy. They alleged that not only were the tests biased against them, but that the Leopard actually won because it met more individual criteria. The latter is actually true, to a point, and some authors claim that these criteria were later reorganized into broader categories by the US Army, categories in which the XM1 was now suddenly ahead. This is essentially a really slimy way of saying that the US had weighted criteria, i.e., some aspects are more important to them than others. Remember back when the GM first won because it was more survivable and cost less? And remember when Chrysler won the second time, when it was more survivable and cost less? Can you guess what the XM1 did better than the Leo? Yeah, that's right. It was way cheaper, and it was way more survivable. The XM1 had higher composite armor coverage, focusing on defeating threats like RPGs and ATGMs from offset angles. The Leopard was, seemingly, designed more for head-on engagements with other tanks. The German delegation actually asked the army to reduce the angle at which they performed ballistic tests, knowing full well that their tank wouldn't stand up to them as well as the XM1. Not to mention that I have found absolutely no evidence that the criteria ever started out as individual points, only to be reorganized into categories. The army had broader categories for the original XM1 tests, and I don't think they would suddenly switch it up for the Leopard. I think it's also important to remember that the army was selecting a tank they would use for combat, not grading a math test. Deciding which tank to choose based on the individual criteria met, with no regard for how important those criteria were, is frankly silly. Especially when we don't know what most of those criteria were. We do know that they could be as small as the number of coax rounds stowed at the loader station, or if the commander's weapon had power traverse or not. When you look at some of the criteria the army did fail at 2AV for, it becomes pretty clear why the XM1 was chosen. XM1 was the clear winner in vulnerability, human factors, and stowed load. Leo has 12 compartmented rounds. The remainder are stored in the hull. What this means is, after firing 12 rounds, you must traverse 90 degrees to the right, remove the ammo from the hull, place it in the compartments, and then resume the fight. German-US cooperation has cost the US $13.1 million, enough to equip all of our scouts in Europe with a weapon to kill BMPs and BRDMs. In my opinion, if we go to war without the above weapon, these kind of figures will come back to haunt us. The last bit highlights something that people don't often consider about tank procurement. Wasting all of your money on the quote-unquote best tank, which is an entirely subjective thing in the first place, could leave other areas of your army underdeveloped. In this letter, he's fretting over the cost of standardization and testing in the first place. Can you imagine how much worse it could have been if the more expensive 2AV were selected? FMC, the company that owned the license to produce the 2AV in the US, estimated that it would be 25% more expensive to make than the XM1. 25% probably doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a huge difference. If the cost or lack of armor weren't enough to dissuade the army, Germany being insincere about the 2AV's weight certainly was. It was discovered that the 2AV that was tested had no special armor installed. No, that's not a conspiracy theory. We have a written note proving it. The Germans had ballasted it to 59.6 tons, but that's not how much a full 2AV would have actually weighed. When taking the weight of the composite from the ballistic hull and turret, and deploying it to a naked 2AV, the army found it would be closer to 64 tons, way over the weight limit. The army was, initially, pretty quiet about this discovery. After the German government started voicing complaints, it was revealed in congressional hearings. Germany withdrew the 2AV after that. As for if the tests were conducted fairly, I don't think there's any real way to tell for sure, but some oversight committees did look into it. According to them, there was no bias, and Germany was actually granted several exceptions. In the end, both the Leopard 2 and the M1 are great tanks. It's just that the M1 was the best choice for the US Army. In an age where people often get their opinions on tanks from media like War Thunder, where only raw performance matters, it's important to remember the soft factors, and that countries have vastly different military needs. Anyway, I hope this video was informative to you guys. It ended up being way, 
Way longer than I had planned, but I think I'm pretty happy with it overall. All of my sources can be found in the description, and I'll probably put them on screen when I show a screenshot or whatever. Anyway, if you guys have suggestions for video topics, leave them in the comments, and I'll see you on the next one.